and Petridi finds a confidant, Elizabeth R. McClellan. I wait for a foggy night, air so thick with ocean some gills would come in handy. I walk out on the jetty, wait until she elbows up on the waiting rock, arms strong from swimming since nearly the beginning of the world. Draped in kelp and loose plastic, she hides herself in her holy beauty. The thing you have to understand, she says, tossing spray from her waterlogged hair, is I could never fit in. They married mostly among themselves, except my husband and the spring girls. She is not foolish. She will say no names here at the border of her husband's fife. You can't compete. I couldn't compete. Just a nymph, really. The kind you knock up and never think of again, unless your wife finds out. They make fun of him, marrying for love and not for greater power, stare down their mountain-high noses at us. I don't think they know how deep the depths truly are, deeper than any hill capped with snow and snobs. Under the detritus, her skin is mother of pearl. Her scales are dark opals, her hair wine and sea. And yes, my husband cheats. Men take liberties since before my time. The harvest daughter only is spared. I cannot fix something when the queen of all cannot even stem the tide. Still, we are happy among the creatures only we know, and the cracks in the ocean floor that descend almost to Hades. He brings me every beautiful thing, Roman bronze and stone from India, and steel now, jewels and lost things. The Nereids do not judge, and have proper manners when they come to dine. The orca sings symphonies, for me alone. I can see them, out of place but reverently attending, patches of black occasionally leaping out in the deep. It's never among equals. My oceanid sisters know I married up. My husband, who pushes continents and calves glaciers, married down. So I talk to you, witch, since witches live in the in-between of humans. It's true, I say, and set a wheel of cheese, well waxed, to float toward her. She smiles, her fearsome smile of sharp teeth, catches it. Thank you. By the time we find it, it's usually ruined. Could you live without it? The question surprises me. I suppose, if I had to. She tears a hunk of it and chews. There's usually a witch of the undersea who used to hear my discontent between spinning spells in the ocean dark and bargaining with drowned sailors. The job is open and under my special protection. The sea needs its witch as its gods and he knows better than to enrage me when I am the calm to his storm. Would you go and live below like a water nymph, breathe salt water and write by anglerfish light? My parents, I say, and hate myself, but she is smiling, all terrible teeth and joy, twists, plucks twelve pearls from the mass of crustaceans that encrust her tail. Well, think you drowned and live better off twelve pearls than off a witch child unlikely to marry or enchant a modern kingdom. Is it a fair trade? Power and pearls? Every hidden thing below the water? I nod, breathless already. Then come. I swim out to the rock, clothes bearing me down until her arms pull me up, knot the pearls in the fabrics I'm shedding despite the cold, and push me back into the depth, where I gulp water and realize it will not harm me, where I see my great body, sleek and patchy like the orca who surround me and bear me up as we watch our queen slide into her domain, shedding disguise, scintillating despite the fog obscuring the moon, and I taste air one last time for always, feel a new power burning in me as I follow her deeper, orca finally leaving us, gathering a bevy of following fish attendants, the Nereids, Oceanids rising up to meet us, caressing my changed face, draping me in jewels and tiny crabs, twisting and knotting my hair as we descend deeper into darkness, hearing the sounds of whales and dolphins and souls lost at sea, my tail powerful and my teeth sharp as I swim for my promised place. <laughs>